All right. Well, today we're continuing the Gospel of Matthew. If you like to follow along in your Bibles, we're really only looking at one verse today, which is Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 6. But uh, it's a deep little passage, and we're going to dig into it today. But as you know, there are some scriptures in the Bible which are difficult to understand. Uh, sometimes we read them, and, and sometimes they're difficult just because the concept is difficult. Uh, sometimes like, it's difficult because it doesn't seem to make sense in our kind of cultural setting. Sometimes things get, get lost in the translation of time and, and context. And sometimes, though, they, just, they, they seem out of character for what we expect from Christ. Let me give you an example. We're told in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church which is divided over between the, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, which means non-Jewish. And he says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Now, I'm a Gentile, and uh, when I read a passage like this, it doesn't really bother me. I don't feel like a second-class citizen because Jesus came first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. I'm just glad that I'm part of the party and that uh, and I joined in, and he called me to be part of his life. So it's a concept like this that we don't really have a problem with. But sometimes there's stories in the Gospels which illustrate these concepts which seem to be uh, difficult for us to understand or to accept. For example, in Matthew 15, and we'll get to this one in a couple months, we'll really look into it, but here's a story that illustrates this idea that Jesus came first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. It says, a Canaanite woman came from the vicinity, crying, uh, a Canaanite from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed from that very hour. So here's a good example of Jesus living out this truth that he came first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. But this is an uncomfortable story, isn't it? I mean, it's not the sort of one that you would use to first introduce someone to Christ. You know, if you're going to say, let me tell you about Jesus. Read this story. It's not the one you would pick first because it seems a little awkward. Jesus seems dismissive. He basically calls her a dog, which is no compliment. Uh, you know, in the, especially in the Jewish world, dogs are unclean. And so this is a difficult story that lives out a truth that, that we really don't have that big a problem with. And the reason why I'm talking about this is we're going to come back to it because there's a lot of hard sayings in the Bible. There's a lot of difficult things which are hard to understand. And I like them. I like these awkward stories because it tells me that someone hasn't gone into the Bible to try and edit it because there's a lot of things we would edit out of the Bible in of our, out of our own humanity. This story is probably one of them. We would just say, let's just set this aside. There's no real need for this to be in there. So let's just set it aside. There's plenty of other stories that illustrate Christ's love, his ability to heal, his power over demons. We don't really need the one where he tells this poor lady who's coming, begging for her daughter's life, it's not right for me to give the children's bread to the dogs. But it's in there. So is King David's mess-ups. So is the fact that Moses murdered somebody. So is the fact that Noah got drunk and passed out naked. You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are in there that we would probably edit out if this were up to us. And I'm glad that they're in there because it tells me that the Bible is an honest book. It's an honest representation of what humanity is like, and therefore I'm going to uh, put my faith in it. It's an honest representation of what God is like. So today we're going to look at one of the difficult little passages that Jesus says. And this isn't nearly as controversial as the one we just looked at. But this is out of Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. And we're going through the Gospel of Matthew in case you're joining us for the first time. And we're just making our way through it. We're in the, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, which is chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel, I mean, of, the gospel of Matthew. And it's really an essential part of, 
of our faith because it's basically a handbook on how to live this out. And Jesus says this, in the midst of, of talking about trust and relationships and love and, and where you put your hope, he gives these little, he starts kind of throwing out these little parables, these little proverbs, these little short vi- wisdom statements, and then he brings in some, uh, some parables around them, and, uh, and chapter 7 is kind of a mix of proverbs and parables and stories. He says, do not give to the dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. This is one of these verses that I think a lot of us are familiar with, and we use it in kind of the vernacular sometimes, uh, especially among the church. But it's funny, commentators don't really talk too much about this verse because Jesus never really explains what he means. You have some people say what this really means is that you shouldn't uh, give those things which are important to people that aren't going to appreciate them. It's obvious that he's not talking literal here. I didn't need the word of God to become incarnate as the son of man to tell me, don't take my jewelry and throw it to pigs. So I know this isn't a literal thing. But some people said, well, this is what he's talking about is that is that you shouldn't take those things which are important to you and give it to people that will find it unimportant because they'll mistreat it. And there's something to that. I think that's kind of on a superficial level. Some people say this is talking about the Gospels, that you shouldn't go and take the Gospels to people who aren't going to care about it. And they'll use the example when Jesus tells his disciples when he sent them out two by two. So if you go into a village and someone is there, a person of peace is there, and you go to their home, you say, you know, the Lord is blessing me on this home. You do your work in the village. But if there's no one there that accepts you, you walk away from the village, you shake the dust off your shoes. And, then, and he says, this is, it'll be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than for those villages. But I, but I look through the overall context of the Bible, and I don't see the idea of withholding the gospel from people with bad attitudes as a normal thing to do. I mean, the Apostle Paul goes out, and he lists kind of the difficulty that he was undergo, he, went, he underwent, you know, being shipwrecked and being imprisoned and being beaten, and uh, it never discourages him from sharing the gospel. He gets angry. One time, it's funny, there's one time he gets angry because he used to always go to the synagogues, and, uh, and he has this outburst because he's just so sick of them always rejecting everything he's saying they, that Paul actually says, from now on, I'm only going to go to the Gentiles. I'll no longer go to the synagogues. And then the very next time it says he goes to, the first place he goes is to the synagogue. And so the idea that, that Paul even just kind of gave up on the Jewish people isn't true. You know, he always went to the synagogues first. I believe that this is a bit deeper than all that. Because when you look at the context of what we've, been, what we've been going through in the scriptures, where we've been looking at the idea that God loves us, God implores us to trust him, and we find that a difficult thing to do, that I believe that what he's talking about here, when he says, for example, Do not give to the dogs what is sacred. He's assuming you have something already sacred in your hands. It's not like you're going to find something and then throw it away. The assumption is you already have it. And he says, do not throw your pearls to the pigs. The assumption is you already have something that is precious. You already have something that is sacred. And what is the precious and sacred thing that we all have? Well, you are all created in the image of God. You all have been blessed with a soul, and a faith. And these things are precious. And as a person created in the image of God, you hold within your hands something sacred. You're sacred. You are that pearl. And like a pearl, which actually is formed when the oyster has this irritating grain of sand, that's how pearls are formed. An irritating grain of sand gets into the oyster, into its shell, and it creates this He puts this kind of coating around that irritating grain of sand to make it smooth so it's not irritating. You are are precious, but you are broken. You're kind of jagged on the edges. You're not not 100% exactly right, and something has to come and make you into something more, but you are precious. And I believe that what this is really talking about is the question of where do you put the sacred you? Where do you put your faith? Where do you put your trust? 
Where do you put your heart? Because you have a world out here that wants to take it from you. It wants to take it. It wants to, it wants to entice your, your desires. It wants to consume your life. It wants to use you. And it will, get, it will take as much from you as you're willing to give it. And this, the world feels no compulsion to give it back. And this can be in a lot of different things. It could be in the area of, of relationships. Sometimes relationships can be toxic. But we love the person, so we like pour ourselves into that. And it ends up consuming us and hurting us. Sometimes it could be a job that is just mind-numbing, soul-deadening as you're just plodding day by day to the grave. Sometimes it can be entertainment, which you really enjoy, but it is corrosive to the preciousness and the sacredness of who you are. And just like the story I told you where we have this concept, which is simple, you know, Jesus came first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. We kind of go, ah, it's no big deal. Yeah, great. But then we have this story which, like, presents it in such an awkward way. Life does that with this whole idea of faith and trust. It's easy for us to say, ah, we should put our trust in Christ. We should put our faith in God. It's easy to say that. It's a concept we, I think we would all agree with. I don't think anyone here or, or out there, if we were to say, you know, should you trust God, yes or no, anyone's going to stand up and go, no, we shouldn't. You know, there are people like that in the world, but I doubt they're watching today. Most of us would say, yeah, we should put our trust in God. We should put our faith in God. It's a concept which is fairly simple to grasp. But when it comes to the reality of living it, that's a whole different story sometimes. That's where it becomes hard. That's where it becomes painful. How do you live trust and faith when, like Andre kind of alluded to, you know, you're a young family whose father passed away, leaving behind children, like five-month-old children. And in the moment, when you're surrounded by people who are caring for you, and in the moment of the shock, you often feel like the presence of God, that's fine. But six months down the road, a year down the road, those are the times when we really are suffering. When there's something going on in our life and we have to trust God with it, it's not in the moment of crisis that we very often feel alone or, or we question things like, did I put my trust in the right place? It's later down the road, six months down the road, a year down the road, when all that support around you is kind of faded away because people get back to their own lives and you're left there alone wondering, what is going on? Why did this happen? Did I put my trust in the right place? Did I put my faith in the right place? These, this is the awkwardness of living out our faith. And we, and we so often want to be such super like, no, everything is fine. And we have like blinders on. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. That when we're confronted with the reality of life, we don't know how to deal with it as Christians because we've convinced ourselves that following Jesus is just this walk through spiritual Disneyland where everyone's always happy, happy, happy. That's not the way it is. So where do you put yourself? Where do you take the preciousness of this person creating the image of God, this person who has the ability to love, this person that has the ability to have faith, this person that has the ability to, to be creative? What an amazing creation you are. Where do you put that sacred you? Oftentimes we wait till we're at the end of our rope to really trust God. You know, we do everything else and then we're at the end. Now I'm going to trust God. And we can even get all spiritual about that. Oh, I'm going to trust God. And it's like, well... You know, it would be nice if you had trusted him earlier, but, you know, we have a tendency to do this. But the truth is, real trust and real faith comes when we have options. When we have options, that's when we really exercise faith and trust. When there's a different path we could take, that's faith, that's trust. Being at the end of the rope, that's just the end of the rope. You know? Might as well. Might as well believe in spacemen, too, if you want. You know, you're at the end of the rope. But when there's options and you choose to follow, you choose to place your heart, your faith into the hands of the living God, that's faith. That's trust. And the disciples, for example, they had other options. When Jesus called the disciples, they had options. Peter had a business. Matthew was a beompter. He was working for the state, collecting taxes. They, they had options. 
It's interesting. I find it interesting that when Jesus calls Matthew, uh, not Matthew, when Jesus calls Peter, James, and John, they've been fishing all night and not finding anything, not catching anything. And then Jesus has them, he says, throw, the, throw, the, on the, throw your net on the other side. And they, they bring in this huge load of fish. And I find that interesting because basically Jesus gave them a, a month's worth of salary. And they could have just sat in the boat and said, whoo, we got a month's worth of salary here. We don't need to follow Jesus. We have serious options. One of the options is here, we can sell all this fish. So Jesus actually gave them uh, a, a serious second option, which is, hey, I just made your business thrive. So now you can choose to stay with me or you can choose to stay with your business. You're going to be blessed either way. One is a once in a lifetime blessing. Once is a lifetime of blessing. It's your choice. Are you going to follow me or are you going to stay with this once in a lifetime blessing that I gave you? Matthew, like I say, he probably had a pretty steady job collecting taxes. You know, no state has ever said we don't want any more taxes. So his job was pretty secure. And, he, and you don't get a sense that Matthew's really at the end of his rope. In fact, there's no real sense of Matthew's life at all. He just, Jesus just comes up to him and says, follow me. We don't hear that Matthew had a bad day or he was going through a divorce or that, you know, he had a gambling addiction. We don't know anything about Matthew. It's just Jesus says, come follow me. And Matthew had options, and he chose to follow. That's faith. That's trust. Being at the end of your rope is just being at the end of your rope. I mean, it's good to turn to God at the end of the rope. But that's not really what we're talking about when we follow God. And so it's important to understand this, especially as you walk through your life as Christians, because as Christians, I think we have a tendency to want to either, we want to have our foot in both worlds. We want to trust God, but we want to make sure that we have uh, other things in place. And we kind of play this mind game in our head where we say, well, I'm trusting God with, with my career. I'm trusting God with whatever, my finances. Those are the two big idols in our lives. Or I'm trusting God with my relationships, but then we make sure we do everything to make sure it goes the way we want it to go. That's a foot in both worlds. And that just ends up leading to being turned on and trampled because you can't have it both ways. This is what Jesus talks about the church in Laodicea. He says, you know, you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either hot or cold. This lukewarm thing. And that's kind of where our faith is a lot of times. It's either mostly, it's either mostly in the world, a little bit in God, or sometimes it's a lot in God, but a little bit in the world. But it's that split thing that keeps us in a place very often of spiritual turmoil. Because we really haven't committed one way or the other. Either commit to just being all about yourself or commit to being about Christ. And it's weird to say that because people will say, well, then I guess I'm going to commit to being about me. Well, if that's what you want, if you want to invest everything you've got into the temporary, that's an option. You have that as an option. If you want to invest things in Christ, those things which won't decay, you know, he talks about storing up for you treasures in heaven, those things which the rust won't get at, the moth won't get at, then there's following him. And I think very often we, we struggle in this place. I had a friend of mine when I was in university, I was part of this campus group, and uh, it was a super blessing, and uh, I had a wonderful time there. And it was about, at, and it, at a zenith when I was in school, there was about 70 or so students that were involved in this on a weekly basis. And we got to be pretty tight. We, we would go on trips together and do things together, and, and it was a good group. Uh, there was this young lady, though, in the group that desperately wanted to find uh, a boyfriend. She wanted to find a husband, eventually. And she just decided that uh, she wasn't going to find uh, a husband in this campus group or in the church because the guys were just more interested in following Jesus than chasing after her, which wasn't true. She was actually quite attractive, and a lot of guys were interested in her, but I don't know where her head went. So she literally, and, this, and, and it's kind of the broken heart to say this, because she was super involved in our, in our group, uh, regularly went to church. Her mom started going to church more often because she had gotten more into faith. She just quit everything, and she told her best friend, you're never going to find a husband if you stay involved with the church and in this campus Christian group 
because the guys just aren't interested in getting married. And she just put herself into the bar scene, into the party scene at the university. And she was very open about this. I'm doing this because these are the guys that are wanting to get together with a young woman. And so she took her sacred self and, and basically told God and everyone else around her, I can't trust him to bring a person into my life that's of quality. I can't trust him to bring anyone into my life. And so she took her life and she put it into the bar. She took her life and she put it into the party scene. And she just dropped out. And as a young believer, this just kind of blew a lot of our minds because we'd never seen someone basically walk away from faith for the reason of finding a mate. It seemed so odd. And this is the kind of thing, this is where having faith and trust in God meets reality. Do you believe, if you're single, do you believe that God is able to bring someone into your life if that is his will? Are you able to accept the fact that, according to the scripture, it's a good thing to be single? It's not a bad thing. It's not this curse. It can be a huge blessing. Are you okay with that? Do you, are you willing to wait for him to bring someone in? And when it comes to your career, what are you focused on? Do you have this dream that you've had ever since you were a child? I always wanted to be a pilot. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. I am so happy I'm not a pilot. Because in the two times of my life that it would have been pretty devastating is I would have gotten out of pilot school right around the time 9-11 happened and there was no jobs. And I'd be right now 50, 52 next month, at the end of this month, you know, kind of retirement's on the horizon and coronavirus hits. <laughs> There's a lot of pilots that don't have jobs right now. There's a lot of great things about not being a pilot, but that, that was the dream I kind of had. In fact, I went through a time of burnout. I was going to quit the ministry. I was going to become a pilot. And you know what God said? He said, you can do that if you want. But if you ever really want to be back where I want you, you can spend $100,000 because that's how much it costs to get trained to be a pilot. You can spend $100,000 to get trained as a pilot, making about $20,000 a year until you get into a big plane, if that ever happens. But if you ever want to be back with where I really want you, you're going to have to go and undo all that and get back to where I want you to be. And it was that realization that I have options, but I really only have one best option with God, and that was to follow him, even through a time of deep depression and really kind of hating the job. And I know you're like, well, isn't pastoring like floating on a cloud every day? No, it's not. In fact, sometimes getting here on Sunday is a huge act of, of trust and faith in God. So how are you going to live your life? You can't live it halfway. If you live it halfway, you're going to be trampled. That's what it talks about. You're going to be trampled on your feet. They're going to turn. Life will tear you to pieces. I've told you the story before. My, my pastor in, uh, in college was a Green Beret. And he was a fascinating guy. And he was a Green Beret in the Vietnam era. And he told a story one time, and I've told you this story before, so forgive me if you've heard it before, but he was on a training mission, and they were, they were jumping into a canyon, and the canyon was tight, and it had trees, on the, trees along the edges and all that, and the exercise was to jump in at night into this canyon and land, you know, get on the ground, and then get on this helicopter that was supposed to be waiting for them. And so... As they jump, they're supposed to be close together because they're supposed to hit the ground pretty much as a team. Bam, 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 bam. Hit, get ready, and go. These are green berets. And so when you jumped and your parachutes opened, they would get into formation, and they'd be so close to the guy underneath them that the, the guy's parachute beneath him would, would block his entire view. He couldn't see where he was going because he was like almost boots on top of the other guy's parachute. And so the training was you just did what the guy underneath you did. Because you couldn't see. The only person who could see where they're going was the leader. And so they did it. They all jumped, and they, all the chutes opened up, and everything was fine. They got into formation. They were coming down to this canyon, and, he's, and it was dark. And he says, all of a sudden, the chute underneath him just did this wild turn. It was completely unexpected. It wasn't what they were supposed to do at all. In fact, it was a dangerous and an unwise maneuver to take in the middle of a canyon that was so narrow with trees to suddenly just turn and go a different direction. 
But his training, all, all that went through his head, but his training just kicked in, and he turned, and the, everyone turned. And he said, as the guy's parachute went around and he began to turn, he could see that the helicopter that they were supposed to eventually go to had landed in the place they were supposed to jump. And so the rotors are, are spinning there, and they all turned and got out of the way. And if one of them had decided, the guy in front of me is doing the wrong thing, I'm going to just keep going, then everyone else underneath him would have just went behind him, would have just gone right into the rotors of the helicopter. And it's always stuck with me, that story, because it's this idea of just radically following. Following even when it makes no sense. Following when it says, this doesn't seem right. Following when faith would tell you, this is the wrong outcome. Following when trust says, I've been betrayed. But you follow anyway because the one leading the way knows where they're going. The one leading the way can see things that you can't see. He understands things that we can't understand. And that's often what it feels like to follow Jesus. You put your faith and you put your trust into a person that sometimes says things which are kind of like, what? Does things which seem crazy. But he knows what's going on. He's the very word of God made flesh. He has a perspective and understanding of life and death and life again that we don't have. And if we're going to be Christians, part of being a Christian is trusting Jesus, trusting him. And as, as, and, and as simple a concept as that is, we all know that living that out can be messy. It can be hard. It can feel like betrayal. It can feel like faith left unheard. It can feel like prayers given but unanswered. But if we trust him as we go into that valley of the shadow of death, which it feels like we do sometimes, and we go into these dark places, he will navigate us through it. And it may not make sense at the time, but in hindsight it makes sense. And let us never forget that we are following a person who was crucified. That does not look like success in anyone's category of success to be nailed to a cross and hung naked and mocked. That's no one's definition of success. The only reason why we even look at it with any kind of hope is because of the resurrection that followed it. But Jesus even said, now I understand he's quoting Psalm 22, but the psalm that he was motivated to speak out loud began, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in fact, in that whole crucifixion uh, story, the only one that really acknowledges who he is is a pagan, a Roman centurion after he's dead, says, surely this was the Son of God. That's very small comfort if that's where the story ends. But it doesn't end there. And this is what we have to remember. There are times when our faith and our trust takes us into places where we feel like, man, someone made a wrong turn somewhere. At least maybe I did or God did. Something isn't right. And we have to remember that even in those times when we feel like crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The very crucifixion of Christ tells us that in those darkest times when, when, the, when the sun is blotted out, when earthquakes are rumbling in our souls, that there is a plan. And man, that sounds trite when you're talking to uh, a child whose father just died or a woman who's made a widow at a young age or a person who finds out that they have a terminal disease. But that is what we cling to. That's one reason why we have on our own Savior being crucified is that he has experienced the depths of spiritual depression and he has experienced resurrection. And that is what our faith is in, that when we're in that depth of depression when it seems like God has forsaken us, that, that faith has become given to the faithless or that trust has been betrayed, that God has a plan to bring us into a place of resurrection. He has a plan to bring us into a place of hope. And if you're going to be following Jesus, you need to get it through your head here and here. This is something the church needs to toughen up and understand that God's view and what he finds important is far more than just your career and your bank account and your love life. He finds who you are, the precious, sacred thing that you are, and who you're going to become important.
your eternal destination is far more important to Christ and to God. And so he will at times have you go through the valley of the shadow of death because you need to grow. You need to learn to trust. You need to believe. And you need to be an example, frankly, for others to look at and follow too. And so it's hard sometimes. And some of you, some of you walk very difficult lives. Some of you, it's become so normal that you kind of forget about it. Some of you have not really suffered a thing yet. Most of you are somewhat in between. Where are you going to put the sacred you? Where are you going to put the pearl of your faith? Where are you going to put the pearl of your trust? Where are you going to put the pearl of your hope? Where are you going to put the sacred you? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have made it possible for us to have an option which is more than the temporary of the world. You've given us the option of faith which allows us to have a perspective that goes far beyond the years of our lives and goes into the eternal, which is something we can't even begin to really understand. And Father, there are some folks here today and watching today, who from, a, from, I think, almost anyone's perspective, are in a situation where it feels like sometimes, yeah, it feels like trust has not been rewarded, and faith, mm, not so much. And Father, I pray for the people in those situations who are, who are walking through this valley of the shadow of death that that they would un remember that you yourself suffered. You understand. You understand betrayal. Judas betrayed you. You understand not being understood. You had a whole crowd of people laughing at you while you were crucified. You understand the pain. You understand the fear. You understand what it's like to, to be beaten and whipped. You understand what it's like to be not understood, to have your brothers say, you know, not believe in you. Your, your half-brothers, you know. It's just, you understand. And yet sometimes, Father, we, we, the, the message of the faith has become so uh, kind of like everything is always good, 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 happy, happy, happy. And things are good, but they're not always happy. And Lord, may we trust you to follow you through those times which aren't very happy, knowing that you instill within us, in spite of the darkness, a joy that cannot be quenched through the power of your spirit. And there's a difference between joy and happiness. And you know that, and most of us know that. But Father, we pray that in those times of difficulty that we would remember the joy. That we would remember the scriptures that say, but for the sake of joy, Christ suffered. That we can walk in that place too. And we don't have to fear. And Lord, for young people and older people and people of all types who may be questioning you know, where they want to invest their life and who they want to invest their life in, Lord God, I pray that, that your spirit would guide them and walk with them. Not everyone has to go into vocational ministry, but everyone who's a believer needs to be where you want them to be. And so, Father, I pray that you would help people to trust you, help me to trust you, to be where you want us to be. Because in that place, we are being prepared for glory. And we thank you and we praise you for who you are, for the awkwardness of the word sometimes, the scripture stories, for those things which are hard to understand and yet deep as we go into them. We thank you for it all. We thank you for it. We thank you for the good days and we thank you for the bad days. We sing about it. You give and take away. You give and take away. It's easy to sing about. It's hard to live. But we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.